Hey everybody, good to see you back once again. I'm going to try not to spend a lot of time on this episode, but I think it is worth doing. There's been a lot of common questions lately in the comment section uh, regarding undercarriage components and things to do, not to do, stuff of that nature, and enough people have been asking the same questions. I think it's it's worth going ahead and just making a quick like response episode to it. And couple that with the fact that I've been doing some draw bar work lately it's kept me busy for a couple of days kind of doing some build up line boring some you know refurb haven't yet got into the belt pulley attachment either so it's just a good time to do it so cutting right to the chase that's a pivot shaft i've had three different people now ask me how much does a d2 pivot shaft weigh because it is a rather considerable chunk of steel and so i had this one out of my grandpa's old d2 and we have the scale right there let's just see and i put a few boards on the scale so as not to completely demolish it <laughs> so if you do this right i think it'll balance all right it's <laughs> it's standing up on its own don't breathe on it we're just going to be ready to catch it but you can see we're 120 pounds that's what a d2 pivot shaft weighs Next question is, can the tracks be lubricated to reduce wear and or noise, like squeaking? And we'll go right to the operator's manual. Do not lubricate the tracks. Under no circumstances should the track be lubricated. The reason for that, well, these are, you know, surface hardened components. They're designed to be in direct metal and metal contact situations, and you're going to get grit and dirt that's going to get between pieces during operation that's an unavoidable circumstance if you would apply like grease or oil to the track chains or the sprockets or rollers what have you that will actually just retain that grit those abrasives and basically turn into a grinding paste which will just in turn wear everything out even faster so if they are left dry yeah you're going to get dirt and grit between pieces but it will then sift back out and kind of self-clean so that's a reason why you never ever ever lubricate tracks next up i got the question of is it possible to take the tracks off and flip them around backwards put them back on to reverse the wear that's a flat no. These tracks are very much an engineered system that are meant to primarily rotate under power in one direction only. Uh, from the sprockets to the links to the pads, every piece of this system has a definite purpose behind it and is doing a definite job when installed properly. If you reverse these and ran them installed backwards, a lot of bad things are about to happen. So to begin, we'll talk about the relationship between the drive sprocket and the track links. So looking at the bottom down here, you can see where the sprocket starts picking the links up and it pivots each link just before it comes into contact with the next bushing. That factor right there is very important. To illustrate it, I'll use these two old torched out sections of D2 track chain. I have the pin driver as a just a stand-in for a track pin for now. So you'll see I took a marker and I made a line around the top of that bushing. So pretend the ruler here is the sprocket, all right? And the sprocket, of course, engages with the bushings on the track chains. So as this link starts to pivot up and come up around the backside of the sprocket, we'll just use the ruler to engage with it. You see how the ruler stays even with that line on the bushing because the bushing is rotating along with the link all right so that's how it's supposed to work when it's installed properly let's flip it around okay we've reversed the track chain so we're on backwards now we'll use the ruler as the sprocket again so we'll engage it with the link and the bushing down here i've aligned the end of the ruler up with the line on the bushing that's just coming into it now when we start pivoting this track link up watch the end of the ruler in relation to that line you see how it's going to have to scrub across the face of that bushing as this back link actually starts to rise the same thing is happening inside these pockets as they are grabbing onto the bushings that are just leading into them so as the track chain starts curling up around the sprocket you're going to have some rotation that's going to be happening bushing to to sprocket right there and that leads to profound wear okay so when the tracks are put on 
properly and you're going in the right direction, you don't have any rotation of that bushing inside that pocket. So the sprocket just grabs onto it and just carries it along with it all the way up and around. Now, one thing that's unavoidable is to have that rotating action bushing to sprocket when you're traveling in reverse. That cannot be helped because you've just reversed the dynamics of the system and that's gonna happen when the track enters under tension at the top. But anyone that's ever built crawler tractors learned early on the most amount of pressure is between the leading sprocket tooth and the leading bushing in contact. The rest of these are just kind of carrying the track. The real pulling is happening right when it's first interfacing with the sprocket. So when you're driving in reverse, that twisting action is not such a big deal because crawler tractors really don't do the bulk of their work in reverse. Whether they're towing from the drawbar or pushing a blade full of material, that's all happening when they're going forward. So keeping that rotation out of the bottom edge of the sprocket is key. Having some rotation where it interfaces at the top, not such a big deal. Looking at the design of the track pads now, so we have Grouser on the leading edge, which is key, and we also have the way they bump up at the back and they allow the track pad behind them to tuck in beneath. That eliminates any gaps all the way down the line. So that right there goes a long way toward keeping material and dirt and mud and everything out of the track chain. To visualize that in action, we'll look at the track chain coming off the idler. Now this track pad is about to be laid flat, but with that bump out now on the trailing edge, that is going to basically clear the way for the next track pad to come in and tuck right in on top of it. So that's taking the dirt and most of the mud and everything, kind of just pushing it down, keeping it out of the way until that next track pad comes in, takes a spot in the line and just, you know, completes the chain basically. So if we took those track pads, put them on backwards, let's pretend that this is the front. So if these tracks are coming down with that bump out now on the leading edge, it's actually gonna act like a scoop because there's nothing about the track pad that's already been laid flat that's clearing the way for this one to come and curl in in front of it. So that's gonna engage first and basically just take anything that it, that's loose enough that it wants, like dirt, mud, whatever, and actually start pulling it up on top of the other track pads in the line. So that's just gonna be actively scooping in abrasives and mud and everything else. Just starts packing the chain tight, getting on the sprocket, getting on the rollers, again, causing more wear. And finally, we'll look at why having the grouser bar on the leading edge of the pad is key. So we look down here, this is where the rubber meets the road. So we're under power and if we get any kind of track slip, it's gonna to wanna to start piling material up on this side of the grouser bar. Okay, so we have this whole area right here that we could potentially fill up with loose material from track slippage. But when the tracks are put on properly and the sprocket starts picking them up and they start coming up and around, we look at that bump out again so what that's gonna do is actually open back up and now it's actually acting like a broom or like a scoop kind of where it's gonna start pushing some of that bunched up material out from the backside of that grouser bar. And as again, you see the track chain comes up around the sprocket because we've broken that link right there between this grouser pad and that one and we have such a gap right here, we have no real estate really left in front of that grouser bar for any of that buildup to stick to like if we're in mud or like sticky gumbo what have you having that open up and then this bump out portion actually like flip some of that away is going to help to keep the leading edges of those grouser bars clean so that when they come down around the idler and engage with the ground again there's nothing that's going to be built up there that's going to cause them to want to slip so if the track pads were on backwards or you could sometimes see this when you're actually driving in reverse through mud with a crawler you get a lot of build up up against the grouser bar here and it will taper almost like a ramp to the back edge of the pad so that when that next one comes down and around you have material that's resisting this grouser bar actually pushing into the ground and giving you traction so again having even the track pads put on correctly goes a long way toward self-cleaning toward better traction toward better life for everything it's all an interconnected system all right, last few talking points center around the super wide track pads I'm gonna run on this tractor. And a lot of questions, comments about that. Uh, a lot of interesting stuff can be learned from just kind of breaking everything down. Not so much a question, but a comment I've seen quite often is, you know, people are getting excited because the tractor's starting to come together a little bit. And a very common thing I've read lately is, I can't wait to see this pushing some dirt. Um, 
not to disappoint anybody but uh putting a dozer blade on this tractor has never been a part of the plan this has been a drawbar tractor its whole life and i'm going to keep it that way that's why we're setting it up to be more of an egg machine where we have the pto on the back i'm just about to get into the belt pulley angle drive that's going to go on top of that we're going to have these wider track pads for like field tillage and stuff like that i don't plan on going into you know lowlands or anything with this that's not why i'm putting them on primarily I'm putting them on because they look cool. Uh, kind of secondary reason is I've been throwing all the little option pieces that I've been accumulating for years and years onto this tractor. And since I'm not putting a blade on it anyhow, it only makes sense we throw these optional extra wide track pads on because no dozer blade that's ever been built for a D2 can clear 20 inch wide pads. 16 inch wide pads is about as wide as you can go. In fact, on the wide gauge D2s, the 16 inch wide track pads is pretty much standard equipment uh, you see these 12s mostly on the narrower gauge the standard gauge ones uh, in fact the first d2s and when 1113 was built it might still have been practice the very first d2s only had 10 inch wide track pads on them so subtract an inch from each side they found that those actually wore the grouser bars out faster because there was so much you know weight still and traction that they were pretty much pushing those things to full penetration full depth in the ground all the time and it started wearing them flat and they found the 12 inch wide pads were kind of the best general all-around track pad for the flotation you get for adequate traction for wear resistance and for not being too wide that they start to get bent and damaged if you're in severe heavy rocky conditions what have you 12s work just fine on a wide gauge machine 16s do look better 20s look best as for maximum width the later 5u series d2s you could get up to 22 inch wide pads. So add about an inch on each side of those and you were ridiculously close to everything because this is where the fenders attach right here. The side panels on the engines are, you know, same width. So you had no margin of error by the time you got the 22s on there. One person was asking if these were not for dirt, if they were made for snow. No, these are made for dirt because they came with the grouser bars beveled like that on each edge from the factory. These shiny spots you see on here is from the past life of these track pads. These actually came off of a Vaughn track kit for John Deere combines for operating in low marshy areas. That's why there's really no wear on them. They've never really been in dirt. But for more flotation still, they had welded C-channel onto these. So you can see where the welds were there, there, and there. And they spotted them right there, right there, and right there. So they had been since cut off before I got them, but that was just for me kind of flushing those welds, those old welds, and just cleaning everything up a bit. We got off track there, and somebody's gonna ask, I know, we're coming back to it. These are Caterpillar pieces. You can see Caterpillar right there. Those Vaughn combine track kits use mostly Caterpillar D2 components. That's why I picked those old tracks up. And yeah, getting back to the beveled edges on the grouser bars that is for maneuverability because uh, someone else pointed out correctly so that most of your traction happens out on your square edge corners of your grouser bars they beveled these because with like a sub 30 horsepower tractor you're already in such contact with the ground that just makes it drivable okay you can actually turn now which leads us into this shoe selection chart now there's some interesting stuff in here it's just a quick breakdown showing that as these factors increase here, these factors also increase, decrease, stay the same, what have you. So it's just to help you choose which track shoe is most suited to your application. People have pointed out how having these wider track shoes on here, these 20s, are actually gonna like wear the pins and bushings and the links more. This isn't my first rodeo, uh, I know all this. You know, with crawler tractors, undercarriage component selection is always a give and take scenario. You have to tailor whatever you put on your undercarriage to your operating needs. Sometimes narrower pads are best, sometimes wider pads are best. It's all, like I said, give and take and you decide pros versus cons, what's for you. So the first heading, the first column right here is shoe width. That's the only one we're gonna look at right now. So as shoe width increases, flotation obviously goes up, penetration traction stays the same, Maneuverability goes down because, yeah, you've got so much in contact with the ground, like I said, beveling those corners off makes it so you can actually turn the thing. Versatility somewhat increases because you can go more places. 
and we have WL is wear life, SL is structural life. So the shoe wear life pretty much stays the same, but the shoe structural life reduces dramatically because if you start operating in like coarse rock, really harsh conditions, the edges of these track shoes are going to start to bend. Okay, so pretty sure, pretty soon they're going to take like an arc to them. That's something that's unavoidable with super wide track pads. So if you're going to go like and drive it over rock piles all the time, super wide tracks aren't for you. If you're going to do like me, keep this like an ag machine for field tillage, low compaction. These are awesome. We're not planning on trying to walk on water or go places where we shouldn't go. We're just out there to look cool and keep the soil nice and fluffy. And of course, pin and bushing, wear life and service life, take a nosedive with super wide pads. Link and rollers, yeah, you're you're still going down. Not as bad as pin and bushing, but overall, you know, you're gonna have more twisting and turning and pulling on those track chains. You know, different amounts of pressure being applied to rollers, idlers, all give and take. But I've pointed out a couple times too in the comment section, let's not like lose sight of the forest for the trees here. These are novelty toys at this point in time. Um, I reset the hour meters or the service meters on all these to full zeros every time I do a full rebuild. I did the same thing on my 5U D2, the one that I call the Iron Mistress. And I finished that one around 2009. And just to give you an idea how many operating hours these things really see, just this last summer, I finally rolled that one over 100 hours on the meter. So eight, nine hours a year on average. And that was when I only had one running D2. I'm about to have two running D2s. They'll each get driven even less. So, you know, like I said, take into account your pros and your cons. My pros for running super wide track pads that will wear the rest of the undercarriage at a faster rate than the narrow ones. I don't put enough operating hours on these things to actually drive them enough to wear them out anyhow. So really doesn't matter. That kind of just cancels itself out because we're not industrial farming here. We're just out having fun. That should answer some of the more common questions I've been seeing in the comments section lately regarding tracks and undercarriage components. Could you do this? Why or why not? It's all good stuff. And also kind of explain why I'm putting some of the pieces on this tractor that I have been kind of what I'm trying to build it to be. So as always, everyone, thanks for watching and I hope to see you back again.